I'll fit that. Um, when we arrived here, Debram was desperately trying to find some students here who, who were smoking cigarettes. Why? Because he's got the bad habit of smoking cigarettes. And I'm trying to break him out of that bad habit. Okay? Uh, I'm not being very successful so far, but I'll keep at it. But what we find, bad habits persist. They can stick with us for centuries. And economics has got some very bad habits, and we're trying to break those bad habits in, at Kingston. And rather than being a bad habit like smoking cigarettes, the bad habit that economists have is the way they think. And, of course, the way they think relates to the words they use. So I want you to give me an idea. You volunteer now. What do you think is an economist's favourite word? What word does an economist use more than any other word, do you think? I'll take them down here. What do you reckon? What word? Pardon? Demand? Pardon? Okay, demand. That's one of the words they use, yeah. Anything else? You know the answer to that. Yeah. What, are, what word do you think, if, 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 you, if you hear an economist speaking, what word is an economist going to use most often? Pardon? Equilibrium. Yes, that's the one. Okay, and I want to show you. That will say that's fantastic. It only took two words to get there, um, which is fabulous. So, And demand's a pretty appropriate one as well. So, yeah, they use equilibrium. That's, that's their word. Okay? So I was ready for that. And... I'll give you an example from Janet Yellen, who, of course, is now the chairman, chairperson of the Federal Reserve. And you, you would want somebody who is chairing the Federal Reserve after as enormous a crisis as 2008 to be thinking a bit differently, because obviously she is somebody who had no idea the crisis was coming. So she wrote a paper in March this year, and that's called Normalising monetary policy, getting back to what we used to do before the crisis. That's what she had in mind. And just to give you a few words from that speech, um, and, and I, economists are really exciting writers, don't you think? Isn't it really exciting to read an economics textbook? I reckon I can last about two pages before I fall asleep with most of them. Well, here she's running the Federal Reserve, and she says, the projected combination of a gradual rise in the nominal Fed's fund rate Combined with, coupled with further progress on both legs of the dual mandate, what on earth is she talking about? Okay, is consistent with an implicit assessment by the committee, by which she means the Federal Reserve's governing body, that the equilibrium real funds rate, which is one measure of the underlying strength of the economy, is rising slowly over time. In the wake of the financial crisis, the equilibrium real rate apparently fell well below zero because of numerous persistent headwinds. Now, whoever knew that the economy was actually a ship? Okay. But equilibrium. So how often did she, she word in one speech? I was just quite fascinated when I read this because one of the things about changing from Bernanke to Yellen was we might get a slightly different way of thinking about the economy. But... I did what's called a word cloud. Have you seen these things called word clouds? You can, you can find a software package on the, on the internet that will take a text you're reading and it will then say, what are the most frequently used words? And you can leave out words like the and of and 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 things like that and say, what are the most regularly used significant words in this person's speech? And of course she's talking about inflation because she's chairman of the Federal Reserve and that's one of the the dual mandate she talked about was controlling inflation and employment. Uh, I can't see employment there. I can see policy, so you're talking about the interest rate, monetary, of course, rates, that's the thing, percent. But the 18th, she used the word equilibrium 18 times. It was the 10th most frequent word she used and the only one that contained a concept when you think about it. Inflation is a measure of rate of change of prices. Okay? Policy is what you do as an action to try to control something. Rates is a measure, again, of the interest rate or the inflation rate, that sort of thing. Equilibrium is a concept about the nature of reality. Okay? And that's the habit. So she's got this concept that the economy is in equilibrium. And if you look at the way economists talk in general, they are obsessed with the idea, this concept, that the economy is in equilibrium either that it's in equilibrium or you have to model it as if it is in equilibrium. And that's the bad habit I want to address. Now, this guy, you wouldn't have heard of him, V.V. Chari, 
but he's one of the most influential mainstream economists, as Devrim was saying, in the world. And after the financial crisis in 2008, the United States Congress actually had an inquiry into economics. Can you imagine? Okay. They actually held a hearing into the nature of economics. This is the Committee of Science and Technology on Investigations into Insight, and it was a testimony about economics. And this, in this testimony, Chari vigorously defended the concept of equilibrium. And he said that uh, if you look at modern macro, uh, they use a common language to formulate their ideas. And it allows for substantial disagreement over substance, but it gives you a framework for discussing. And he says a useful aphorism or saying in macroeconomics is that if you have an interesting and coherent story to tell, you can tell it in what he calls a DSGE model. Now those characters stand for dynamic, which is a good thing, stochastic, which means shocks, general, which means it covers everything, equilibrium, model, equilibrium, model, dynamic, stochastic, general, equilibrium. And that's poor old Devram here, did his PhD building a DSGE model. So he knows all about the mathematics of this, extremely complicated mathematics. Complicated but not complex. Now he said if you can tell, if you have, Bashari again tells the United States Congress that if you have an interesting story to tell, you can use it in a model which has those components where equilibrium is an essential part of that concept. He says if you can't tell it, in, if you can't tell your story in that framework, your story is incoherent. So what he's really saying is economists believe if you don't assume equilibrium, you're being incoherent. So he's saying disequilibrium, out of equilibrium, you're incoherent. Okay? Well, I want to show you a simple causal model of something. And not of economics, but of the weather. By the way, we're thoroughly enjoying being here rather than Bogota. Uh, Devrim, Devrim's born in Turkey, I'm born in Sydney, Australia. This is typical weather for me. I feel quite at home. I'm going to go for a swim later. Okay. Now, Lorenz's model of the weather relates back to work done by a, a, me, a mathematical meteorologist. So it's a highly mathematical discipline. Mathematical models of the weather, trying to predict cyclones, storms, whether it's going to be hot or cold one day, that sort of thing. And he, to start building what is modern meteorology, the, the mathematics that lies behind all the weather reports you see on TV today. You know those, you know, when you watch the weather report, often the sexiest part of the news, okay? All those patterns of moving simulations you see, they're built using computer models of the weather that began with this guy's work back in the 1960s. And he built a simple model of having a pot of water on a stove. Now, you know if you put a pot of water on the stove and turn the stove on, you'll see cycles start to happen in the water. Yeah? Oh, sorry, it's still, still too fast? Sorry. Okay. I, I tend to get carried away. I'm okay. So, okay. so the, heat, the heat of the stove makes the water circulate. It doesn't just rise, it cycles. So he wrote a simple model of that that had just three variables in it and three constants. And this is the set of equations. Now, what that's saying is the... The X and the Y, if you, if you, if you have, look at the pot on the stove, then the X is like the, the front of the stove and the Y is going front to back. Okay? So that's whereabouts is the water on the hot plate and the Y, the Z, is how hot is the hot plate. Okay? Those are the equations. Now, I'm going to simulate that model for you in a software package I've designed called Minsky. And I've got it in equilibrium right now. So this is going to show the Y value, wh whereabouts the, the water is front to back on the stove versus the temperature in equilibrium. Now, isn't that exciting? The water doesn't move. It stays in the one spot. Okay? That's modelling the water in equilibrium. Does that look like the weather to you? Is it always 23 degrees? Does it never rain, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? Okay, that's an equilibrium. Well, what happens if instead I give it a tiny shock? I just move it away from equilibrium just a bit. So that's what I've shown you there at the moment. That's the equilibrium. You measure it, and the, the drop of water stays in exactly the same spot on the stove, never moves. Um, so let's just now do 
a tiny little shock to it, and I'm going to get rid of the shock, so it's only happened once, and I'm going to simulate the model and see what happens now. And now what you see is it's cycled over to one part of the hot plate, but it's starting to move away. <coughs> Keeps on turning. And I'll let it go on for a bit longer. It takes a while before you start seeing the real interesting stuff here. So it looks like it's going to blast away from where it is. Keep on turning. Notice it's getting bigger and bigger. What do you think is going to happen? Is it going to just explode right out? Watch. I'll wait till it just makes one little jump here. Let's see. Now notice what's doing. Now notice I started it over here when it was in equilibrium. What do you think that spot there is there in the middle, the black, the hole in the middle? That's another equilibrium. And around here is a third equilibrium. And they are all unstable. Okay? The weather will go towards them and be repelled and then cycle around for a while and be repelled to another spot. So you'll go from a hot day to a cold day. You'll go from calm weather to a cyclone, etc., etc. And this on concept of a non-equilibrium model, always out of equilibrium, is commonplace in real sciences. That's what meteorologists do, it's what physicists do, chemists, biologists, etc., etc. So economists are locking themselves out of thinking this way. So that's when I continue simulating the model. That's the sort of behaviour I get. Does that look like the weather? Okay. Complex patterns, changing all the time. So in the real world of disciplines that actually have to analyse serious things like the weather, and if the weatherman tells you it's going to be fine weather and you go out and there's a cyclone, you, know, you tend to complain. Okay. And the weatherman doesn't really care whether the weather's in equilibrium or not. He wants to understand it. So they weren't at all wedded to this bad habit of thinking about equilibrium. And they were very happy to adopt this idea of modelling a non-equilibrium system. And the real world tells us that most of the interesting systems are out of equilibrium. So what about the economy? Do you think that's an equilibrium? Okay. It's nonsense to say it's an equilibrium. This is looking at the American economy from 1980 to 2012, 2011, and what you can see is the, the blue line is the inflation rate and the red line is the unemployment rate over time. And what economists like Janet Yellen and Ben Bernanke saw was the system heading towards equilibrium. And then bang, that happened. Unemployment exploded in the financial crisis. Inflation became deflation. So what they've missed out on, they, have, they didn't see this coming because they think in equilibrium. So I want to take you through a way of applying that same sort of thinking to economics now and just see what happens if we take simple stylized rules about how the economy operates and put them together and see what we get. So output, the amount of firms decided to produce a certain amount of output and to produce that output they have to hire workers. Okay, so output roughly speaking, determines how many workers you employ. Employment determines the rate of change of wages. You know this idea of the Phillips curve? You've done the Phillips curve? Okay, so if virtually every economic model has the idea that the level of employment is a major 
determinant of how much wages change. So we just have that in there. Then if you have output and you have employment and you know the wage rate, you can work out what wages are. So if you subtract wages from output, you have profit. Okay? Now, we live in a capitalist economy and the rate of profit determines how much capitalists wish to invest. High rate of profit, they want to invest a lot. Small rate of profit, invest nothing. Okay? And investment is the rate of change of capital stock. The investment adds to your machinery. Not investing means your machinery runs down. Okay, So that's, that's the rate of change of capital. And capital, roughly speaking, and the number of factories you have will determine how much output you can make. That's a simple little causal model. Okay, Let's put that together and see what happens. And I'm using the software package I showed you a moment ago. It's called Minsky. It's free, open source. You can download it today if you want to from a place called SourceForge. So I'm using the same software to build models of the economy as well as the weather. Now let's bring this up and I'll take you through what I've done here. But if I had time with the class, I'd, I'd build it in front of you. But that's I'll show you a couple of steps of what it's like in a moment. But here I have, let's make that scale a bit larger so you can see more clearly. Okay. So I start here by saying, here's, here's output. And if I divide output by labour productivity, so how many units of, of uh, output does each worker produce, then I get how many workers you need. Okay. So employment, if you divide output by how productive workers are, you work at how many workers have been hired. Fair enough? Then if I divide employment by the population level, I get the rate of employment. Now again, the Phillips curve argument says that there's some level of employment where workers don't demand wage rises. Above that level, they'll ask for wage rises. Below that level, they'll want they'll accept wage cuts. Okay, that basic idea. I call that the no wage change level. So if I subtract the employment rate from this no wage change level, I get whether the employment rate's bigger or smaller than the level where workers want wage rises, and then. I say, well, how much do workers react? Let's say the let's say the no wage change level of employment is 65% of the population has a job, but at 66% they'll want wage rises. At 64% they'll accept wage cuts. Well, this little number here just says, well, what sort of wage change do they want? So let's say if employment's 1% above that level, let's say it's 66% rather than 65% then workers want, say, a 10% increase in wages. It's extreme, but I'm just giving you an example. So that's what I've got there. That gives me my Phillips curve. Now, if I multiply the Phillips curve by the wage rate and integrate that, it gives me the wage rate. It's what's called a differential equation. Has anybody here done mathematics and done what are called differential equations? Any? Some. OK. Well, I'm, I'm using them. For, did you enjoy them? No. You didn't? <laughs> Probably badly taught, yeah. uh, and they they wouldn't have used software like this to make it interesting. So, but sitting behind that, I'll just show you over here. We're looking at a whole set of differential equations. What I've what I've designed there is a whole set of differential equations. So there's your wage rate. If I multiply the wage rate by employment, I get how much workers get paid. If I subtract that from output, I get profit. I have all the profit being invested. I subtract depreciation from investment, that gives me the rate of change of capital, and that gives me output. So what do you think, if I press the start button, run it, what am I going to get? Do you think I'm going to get equilibrium? Okay, you're right. Okay. What I get is cycles. There's the cycles in the employment rate and the wages rate. Employment is the left-hand graph, wage rate is the middle graph, and I'm graphing them both against each other in the third graph. So you get cycles. So a coherent way of looking at the economy out of equilibrium gives you cycles, not equilibrium. So economists are wrong to believe you must have equilibrium to be coherent. In fact, I think if you think everything's in equilibrium, you are incoherent. That's the mistake. They've got it the wrong way around. So that's a bit of it. You see the cycles there. But it's still not completely realistic because I've left out whole lots of elements of the real world there. But it's easy to model those elements of the real world today using modern technology. So I'm going to add some realism. The model I showed you assumed that capitalists invest all their profits. Does that sound right to you? What are they? All their profits? 
every last cent. They don't go buy some yachts out there. And theory says that. Pardon? Theory says that. Theory says that, but reality would say, yeah, reality would say that they'll invest less than their profits when in, when in profits are really low. Bang! I'll put the money in the bank. Okay. When profits are really high, what do they do? They borrow from the bank. Okay. They need. It comes to positive money stuff. They need money. If they want to invest more than they've retained in profits, they have to borrow money for it. So that's what I'm going to model now. So I'm going to bring that in. And let's take a look at it. So it's exactly the same model as I've just shown you, only what I've added down here is that there's now, just like I've got a Phillips curve for the workers up here, I now have an investment function for the capitalists down here. I'm saying there's some profit rate that if that profit rate applies, they simply invest that much. So I call that the invest profits level. And if the profit rate is equal to that, they simply invest what their profits are. So they invest all their profits. But if profits are profit rates higher than that, then they invest more. Okay? And if profits are less than that, they invest less. And I've got how much they react to that too. So if there's a one percent profits one percent higher than their desired level or the level they just invest what they earn, they borrow 10% more from the banks. And of course, when you borrow from the banks, you have to pay interest. So I now have debt service, and I subtract that from output to give me what profits are. And I'm just going to simulate, first of all, with a very conservative bunch of capitalists. And what you get, notice the cycles are different. The cycles converge to equilibrium. Okay? So you've reached equilibrium. Isn't that great? But what if the capitalists are more adventurous? Let's go and just, I'll bring up a third model with that because I've done it a bit rather better than the other one. Let's, let's, let's put it one, let's see. Okay. What I get, look at the side, I'll slow it down a bit, it's going too quickly there. What happens first of all are the cycles. Notice the cycles in employment are getting smaller. So you're looking at that, you might think we're heading towards equilibrium, okay? But notice I'm now measuring the, the ratio of private debt to GDP, and that's rising. And notice the cycles here are, are drifting down, which means what's actually happening is wages are falling. Workers getting less money in this system. But debt's rising, and the bankers are getting the money, okay? Keep on going for a while, and rather than those cycles continuing to get smaller, they suddenly start to get larger. And notice the debt ratio is continuing to rise. And this keeps on going for long enough, you get booms and busts, and suddenly profit collapses and the economy collapses completely. And you break down completely. The economy collapses into a black hole of private debt which is where we are now. So that's really how to model the real world, breaking the bad habit of economists, like this guy's bad habit of smoking cigarettes, breaking the bad habit of believing in equilibrium. We have to break the bounds of equilibrium and we'll learn how the economy actually operates. And that's why people like myself saw the crisis coming when the mainstream didn't. And this is what we teach you at Kingston amongst many other things. There's many other approaches to economics apart from what I've shown you there, but this is what we want to do. And start your own movement here. And if you, I think you're going to be successful here, you've got good staff like Andres here, and open-minded people who teach you a range of views about economics. But if you want to come and do a master's or a PhD, come and join us at Kingston. Thank you.